Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to our spotlight talk on Wharton's outdoor sculptures. My name is Maria. I am the visitor engagement manager at the Wharton Eschrick Museum. I'm joined today by communications and special programs manager, Katie Wynn and director of curatorial affairs and strategic partnerships, Emily Zilber. We're all really happy to be here with you all today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us on this extra cold, windy afternoon. Do I see a, a hand up? Okay. So while the museum remains closed for the time being to in-person visitors, we are hoping to have reopening plans for you um, before too long. We've really been enjoying doing all these virtual programs. So today in our program, we're gonna be thinking spring as we step virtually outside and head into the garden for this, the latest installment of our Spotlight Talk series. Our Spotlight Talks, just for some context, are very brief monthly virtual talks, each focused on a different piece in our collection. You can see previous talks as well as um, other previous virtual programs on our YouTube channel or on the past programs page of our website. Next month, in honor of the opening of our annual woodworking exhibition, we will have a spotlight talk with the same theme, wood and dot, 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 exploring how Eshret combined wood and other materials, which is what we asked the entrance in this year's exhibition to do. And for any five to seven year old nature lovers in your life on Saturday, May 1st, we'll be doing a story time program, um, virtually of course, in which we read a few poems from Rhymes of Early Jungle Folk, a 1922 book of children's poetry on the subject of evolution. The first book that um, Escherich would end up illustrating marking his uh, transition from painter to woodworker. We'll also have a fun, a fun nature theme printmaking craft to go along with that. So coming back to today's program, should you have any questions while we're talking, um, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. We've set aside a few minutes at the end to address them. So if you prefer, we'll give you time to just unmute yourself and just kind of shout them out then. We do ask that you please keep yourself muted until that time. There's a lot we wanna show you and very little time, but if you are comfortable, go ahead and turn your video on because we would love to see you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So before we begin, one thing that I want to address is, uh, I think one thing that's really important to understanding Wharton's work, excuse me, is understanding that he had this really deep abiding love for nature. It is just so abundantly clear in just about everything he does from natural imagery to natural forms, plenty of natural materials. So keep that in mind today as we look at his outdoor sculptures. Though not an, exactly an outdoor sculpture, I wanted to set the stage for this by addressing the background photo here. We have some very talented photographers on our team. I most certainly did not take that picture. So in front of the studio, we have um, this bed of peonies. They are descended from uh, Letty's, Wharton's wife's peonies. She had inherited them from an uncle and would be growing them at the farmhouse that was just down the hill from where the museum is now. The peonies were sold to florists for Memorial Day in local colleges like Bryn Mawr for graduations. Here we have a photo of Letty doing just that and an advertisement Warden made just for that venture, one of his prints, though not exactly a sculpture, very close. So at this point, I'd like to briefly travel virtually down to Fairhope, Alabama, a place that was so critical to the trajectory of Eshrick's career. Warden and his wife, Letty, had gone in 1919. It's where he sort of discovered woodworking. So his career really took a, a really key turn at that point. It's a place where in winters, artists, poets, and all sorts of thinkers and makers from all over would descend. Warden made a number of key connections there, including a potter by the name of Peter McAdam, whom he happened to encounter by chance on a return trip 10 years later in 1929. Together, Eshrick and McAdam created about 23 or so ceramic garden sculptures. You're looking at just a couple here, Heffalump and Hanging Monkey, a, a cast of a ceramic piece. For me, one of the most interesting things about Wharton is how unafraid he was to try new things. 
um, that's what this interesting and unique time in his career really represents to me. He tried different styles. He tried different media as we're celebrating in, a, in our woodworking exhibition this year. And when something didn't work, he would just change it. A fan favorite of these uh, ceramic sculptures with good reason, I would argue, is Winnie the Pooh. A little hard to tell who he is, I know. To, I think today my favorite guest has to be a penguin. The photo on the left here, we have Wharton with Winnie and I believe unglazed elephant, another of those ceramics from um, this period. And I like the, the photo on the right, um, Winnie where he is today on the deck of the studio. I like this photo of him because you can get a, a much better look at him. Look at those legs, do they look familiar to anyone? Does anyone see pipes? McAdam turned to making pipes to kind of get himself through the depression. So that's where those come from. A photo of the Eschrick children, Mary, Peter, Ruth, and somehow a monkey playing with uh, Winnie the Pooh. More of those ceramics in their natural habitat. Now they weren't all purely decorative. Um, they were all sculptural though. An important thing to understand about Warden is his knack for blending the sculptural with the functional and the user-friendly. So on that note, may I present one of my favorites, stump chair. Ashrick was so incredibly resourceful. When Woodman moved into the hillside in Paoli where he lived, they left chestnut stumps in their wake. So Ashrick came along behind them, scooped up the stumps, turned them over and made them into these fantastic chairs. I love how the arms and the back move sort of like the roots of the tree did. So now to tell you a little more about a few more outdoor sculptures, both decorative and functional, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie Wynn. So take it away, Katie. Thank you, Maria. Um, it's wonderful to see those. And um, if you wanna to head to the next slide. Um, so I, was thinking about Eshrick uh, in his love of the outdoors. And one of the first pieces that I thought of to share was actually the birdhouses. Um, I love that he is not only, you know, making something sculptural and exciting for his own eyes, but he is turning it over to the birds to live in. Um, and of course, anyone who has been to the studio uh, has seen that birds are represented, you know, in lots of places. They're carved on the doors, they're, hanging uh, for light poles, they're, um, they're all over the place. So, um, or the coat or pegs inside the door, there's sort of like a homage to birds all over the place. And so the, there's two birdhouses here that we're aware of. One on the left is 1927. The one on the right, the green one, we're not so sure, but it's probably from the same time period. And then I've also included um, a little carving of a bird that's called tumbler pigeon that's made around the same time. So he was certainly thinking about, as Maria was saying, how to, um, how to play around with these ideas, both in purely sculptural form, as well as in something functional. They're both uh, pine, both very rough. They, they, these birdhouses were absolutely used out in the world. Um, and I think the other thing that's really interesting about them is that it was a space where Eshrick could really play around with the expressionist forms that he was just kind of getting into in this period. So I included a picture of the drop leaf desk. That's a, a major piece that people see in the studio. Um, it's from the same time period as these birdhouses, but you can see where, you know, because he was, um, you know, you're, there's so much planning, there's so much time that goes into making this big furniture piece is not quite figuring out how to do these wild expressionist angles in a furniture piece yet. You can see it in the carving, he's playing around with design, he's playing around with triangles in the branches that are carved into the front there. Um, but it's in these little pieces, these little carvings, these fast constructions that he can really start to play around. I didn't put it in this slide, but I think um, if you've seen the, uh, the outhouse, that is um, on the, the, there's a replica uh, at the studio now. It is this three-sided prismatic form that um, 
that is sort of inspired by German Expressionist films. And this green birdhouse is really similar in the shape. It's hard to tell from this photo, but it is also three boards that taper and come to a point. And so the, if you could flip that over, it's almost like a little model of the outhouse. And then another animal, aside from birds, that we see all the time in Estrick's work is horses. So if Maria, if you want to go to the next slide, I had to include the hedgerow horses. Uh, so the photo on the left here is a shot from uh, sometime between 1935 and, and 56 when the horses were outside there. Although it's hard to, it's probably on the earlier side of that, but hard to say for sure. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Hedgerow Theater is down in uh, Rose Valley, not far from Swarthmore in that area. Um, very avant-garde theater when they opened in the 1920s, um, founded by an actor and director named Jasper Dieter. And the Eschricks loved this theater. Um, uh, Wharton would use the lobby, and as you can see here, he would use the lawn for his sculptures uh, in the hopes that someone who likes, you know, cutting edge theater is going to be interested in his sculpture as well. And the Eschrick family was also very involved. So um, Letty lived there for many years. Later on, the kids were all involved in, you know, acting on stage. Um, it was really, it was really a spot that they were really intertwined with. So these horses, uh, Cheater and Jeter, were outside there for over 20 years. Um, and Eschrick said that he would paint them different colors. So of course they're wood, and so they have to be maintained as outdoor sculptures. Um, but uh, being Eschrick, he did not paint them the same color every time. So for example, the one that is at the studio now is blue today, but he might have been yellow one year and purple the next year and red the year after that. And I should also mention, you notice the names Cheater and Jeter uh, are, they rhyme in this playful way with uh, Jasper Dieter, who founded the theater. So Cheater, Jeter, and Dieter are all at the theater. <laughs> and uh, if you wanna go to the next slide, Maria, I also included um, some shots of one of them in progress. It's hard to say which one, uh, but on the right, you're seeing a shot from 1934, where this wonderful big mass of uh, a branched section of uh, white oak um, is being hoisted up in front of the studio there. And that is how both of the horses were made. So they're not exactly one solid piece, but the, he's taking advantage of the way that branches would come out of a trunk uh, to suggest a leg and, and start to build the sculpture from there. And then the guy in the upper left there is not Eschrick. That's actually uh, a man named Ed Ray, who was Wharton's friend and, and wood supplier. And I wanted to just throw him in here because it, it you know, for one, it's such a big operation to to bring these massive pieces of wood, um, well, to haul them anywhere, but then to be moving them around to make sculpture. And I thought that your wood supplier, your Sawyer is a really important part of that story. Um, but it also, I think Ed Ray was really, um, as a friend of Eschrick's, he was really excited to, to see what Eschrick could do with these different pieces of wood that he could find. He was someone who had been trained out um, in the Northwest in logging. And then when he came back here as a friend of Eschrick's, he would bring him all the unusual pieces of wood that, you know, maybe as he's logging the main line, uh, he's finding things that aren't great for construction purposes, but for a sculptor like Eschrick, some twisting strange piece of wood is gonna be perfect for sculpture. So the fact that Ed Ray was, you know, excited and interested in what Eschrick was gonna do with things made for some interesting work. And then in the last side, if you wanna to head to that, Maria, Here's um, just a couple more shots of the horses, in this case, with, with kids involved as well. Um, so on the left is Eshrick's son, Peter, on uh, the horse known as Jeter. And that's, that's when it was brand new, 1934. And then on the right is a casting of the other horse um, at the school in Rose Valley, which is directly across the street, um, or basically across the street from the Hedgerow Theater. And uh, the story goes that those horses were, you know, outside of the theater for some 20 plus years. 
And the kids at this school across the street, of course, love these horses and they would climb all over them and, and have a great time. And when they, I think it was the mid fifties, you know, the Asterix decided, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna bring those horses inside. They've been out, outside long enough. Um, all those people who had played on those horses had grown up and become parents and didn't wanna see those uh, disappear. And so they paid for a casting to be made um, and installed at the school across the street. So that's in the schoolyard there. And I thought I would just read a little quote from, uh, this is from the Eshrick biography written by Bob Bascom, Wharton's son-in-law. And I thought he just said it really beautifully. He says, Cheater was particularly popular with the children from the school in Rose Valley across the road. Once you were big enough to get a leg over the horizontal tail, you could shinny forward and ride the horse wherever your imagination yearned to go. So that's, um, I think, you know, many of us can relate to having a special sculpture or a special piece of public artwork that, you know, maybe your parents played on as well, or you have some, you know, special place in that. So I think it's really lovely that, that this Eshrick sculpture captured that imagination. And I think with that, um, we can open it up for questions. And Maria, if you wanna end the screen share, we'll see if anybody has any, any stories to share. If anybody has climbed on that horse themselves. <laughs> Has anybody made their own birdhouse in expressionist style? We have one in the chat. When will the museum be open? Um, we are working on getting our staff fully vaccinated. And um, at that time, we're hoping to be able to announce official reopening plans to you. So stay tuned. I see, um, I see that somebody did climb on that horse as a child, which is wonderful. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, I think, so So Eva Jane asked, um, would you say that Eshrick could see the finished horse in the piece of wood before he began working on it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's always hard to know exactly what the, you know, the process or what was in someone's mind as they began something. But in general, we think of Eshrick as being like a direct carver when he's making his sculpture. So he didn't necessarily plan um, or make a model of a, of a sculpture like that. He was responding to what he could see in the wood, um, responding to what he, he was very skilled at knowing what the grain might be capable of and, and how to sort of bring that out. So yeah, I think that's, um, it would be fair to say that he was responding to the pieces that he that he saw. Um, Mary asks, what special considerations are made today to maintain or protect the sculptures that are outdoors? I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this, but I can tell you that I, part of what we do is um, bring them inside during um, inclement or harsh weather. Anyone have anything else to add? No, that's exactly right. Yeah, the ceramic pieces come indoors and um, and the horses are indoors now. So Cheater, the blue horses is inside the studio. And then the other one is actually in a museum in uh, Mount Dora, Florida. Mm. So should you ever be on vacation there, you can, you can look for the Modernism Museum Mount Dora. Mm. You uh, mentioned that there are cast of the horses at the school across the way. Mm -hmm. And how broadly distributed are those cast? I mean, so th there is just the one um, <clears throat> life size or two, or two scale cast of Cheater at the school at Rose Valley. As far as I know, it was just that one, um, one copy was made for them. And that wasn't entirely uncommon for Eshrick. So we see other bronzes. We have a few in the studio. So occasionally there would be a copy made, uh, but generally, you know, per commission, one at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Other questions, other things people are wondering? Um, we have um, a question. I noticed you're recording this event. Are there videos of previous events like this? Yes, there are. Um, okay. Check out our YouTube channel. We can link you to them um, in our follow-up email after this event. We also have a past programs page on our website with lots and lots of great videos. All right. If anyone has any last questions, feel free to feel free to chime in. And if not, I think we'll we'll get out there for Earth Day, right? I know everybody <laughs> appreciates the outdoors, especially these days. And even if it's a little breezy, we'll be happy to be out there, right, Maria? Right, right. Just bundle up if you're in the immediate vicinity. <laughs> Wonderful. If you want to unmute yourself and say goodbye, you're welcome to. We've done that in past programs, and we're so glad that you all joined us today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well Thank done. You. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.